Let me take you back to 2013. Vines, selfies, swag, rainbow looms, royals, wrecking balls, dumb ways to die, what does the fox say, Harlem shakes, Minecraft, iPad minis we use, PS4's Iron Man 3, World War Z, Despicable Me 2, and of course, me and my friend singing Oxygen on a $50 karaoke machine at my friend's birthday party. <laughs> For Disney Channel in 2013, they were running sitcoms like Good Luck Charlie, Shake It Up, Ant Farm, and Dog with a Blog. This was the beginning of the end. Personally, I would consider Best Friends Whenever to be the dropping off point for most people in determining when Disney Channel went bad, and that includes the Lizzie McGuire kids and the Shake It Up kids. And considering that Best Friends Whenever premiered in 2015, 2013 Disney Channel was near its expiration point, at least in the eyes of Gen Z. But we'll save an in-depth discussion of that topic for another video. For now, it's merely setting the stage. Disney Channel was going down, but not without a fight. If the shows were declining in quality, why not try to save the network with a movie instead? 2012 had hosted such successes as Girl vs. Monster, Let It Shine, and the legendary Radio Rebel. As I said, they were successes, but Disney Channel needed more than just a success. They needed a franchise. They needed another high school musical. Something that would define a generation and sell them heaps of merchandise. Okay, let's just do that again. We're only making this for kids after all. They'll be too stupid to notice. Let's take a tropey story that we can parody but still fully embrace the cheesiness of with two leads who break the status quo, fill the rest of the cast with recognizable and very marketable archetypes, throw in some catchy songs and flashy choreography, and slap a straightforward tongue-in-cheek title on that bad boy and boom! Teen Beach Movie. Teen Beach Movie was my high school musical. It lovingly parodied the classic beach party movies of the 1960s in an energetic, musical fashion that never took itself too seriously. I've wanted to make a video about this movie for a while, and now that summer's coming to a close, I figured this would be the perfect send-off for the season. To give you a quick plot summary, Teen Beach Movie is about two teens, Mac and Brady, who live on the coast and spend their summer days surfing away. For Brady, he's living his dream, but Mac has other plans. She has to leave with her aunt to go to a prestigious private school because of the deal they made when her mom died. This puts a rift in Mac and Brady's relationship, and Mac decides it's best if they just break up and forget the whole thing happened. Still, even if she has to leave tomorrow, Mac can't resist catching the biggest waves of the season like the bodacious surfer she is, and she goes for one last ride before she catches her plane while Brady watches her from the shore. The tides turn when the storm ramps up to a dangerous level, but Mac refuses to give up this chance to ride a gnarly wave and swims out anyway. Brady rushes is in on a jet ski to save her, and the two end up getting sucked beneath the waves. Luckily, Mac was riding her grandfather's surfboard of destiny. That's not the weirdest thing we'll encounter in this movie. And so, Mac and Brady get transported to the world of his favorite movie, West Side Story. See, it's West Side Story, but without all of the dark themes of bigotry and gang violence. Mac and Brady are introduced to the surfers and bikers, two rival gangs who are fighting for the control of big mamas. The story of the movie goes that Tanner, the leader of the surfers, and Layla, the sister of Butchie, who leads the bikers, fall in love despite their differences, only to end up dying along with many of their other friends in a Shakespearean tragedy. Just kidding, the power of love saves the day and unites the gangs. Unfortunately, all of this changes when Mac and Brady accidentally interrupt Layla and Tanner's meeting, and now Tanner is in love with Mac and Layla is in love with Brady. Over the course of the movie, Mac and Brady work together to get Layla and Tanner to fall in love, repairing their own relationship in the process. This is all so that they can get to the true ending of the movie, where Layla and Tanner unite unite the surfers and bikers to stop the evil real estate mogul Les Camembert from creating a storm that destroys big mamas. Okay, so Camembert wants the beach property because he knows it'll be valuable one day, but the surfers and bikers won't leave because they both want big mamas. And his plan is to create a storm using this sci-fi weather machine so that the surfers can't surf because of the bad weather, and the bikers can't ride their motorcycles because the metal will be rusted from the humidity. Even as a kid, this confused me, but it's really just one big excuse for there to be a storm so that Mac and Brady can ride it to get back to the real world. The logic being that they entered the movie world on a storm, so they should be able to exit the movie world on a storm. Either way, Mac and Brady make it back to the real world. Mac realizes that she should be able to make her own decisions for her life and decides not to go to the prep school so that she can enjoy being a high schooler and everyone dances it out. To be honest, the plot in Teen Beach Movie doesn't really matter. Just like High School Musical, we're not here for an in-depth plot that challenges our expectations and asks deep questions about the universe. We're here for good songs and likable characters. 
characters. These characters are what save these movies from being bad. They become like friends to us, and we want to watch them interact in entertaining situations and feel that emotional payoff whenever they finally achieve their goals. So even if the Les Bear plot is ridiculous and feels awkwardly tacked on, I don't think it really matters. You're not here to watch how Layla and Tanner will outsmart the evil genius of Bear in a well-thought-out plot. You're here to watch them work together to defeat the bad guys with the power of their love, and watch Bertram achieve his emotional catharsis as he finally gets to murder a child. Ready? The plot is only here to facilitate funny interactions and emotional beats for this cast of characters. It's not the selling point of the movie. So that's all well and good, but how are the characters? They're okay. That's really all I have to say. Mac and Brady are pretty good characters, but they do not do a good job as the two leads. By that I mean, I enjoy both of them perfectly fine on their own, but I could never get invested in their relationship. We get a few minutes of fun time montage at the beginning, and then Mac and Brady are immediately fighting over Mac having to leave for fancy school, and now they're broken up. It's been 10 minutes. Then they land in West Side Story, and they're fighting again. They accidentally interrupt Layla and Tanner's meeting, and they're still fighting! Even though I think they should have given us more than a montage to get invested in their relationship so that we can actually root for them to get back together, the movie is not doomed just yet. We need to start with some conflict so that we can feel rewarded whenever Mac and Brady overcome these struggles and learn their lessons. And it seems like Teen Beach Movie has the perfect way to do that. Force Mac and Brady to work together to make Layla and Tanner a couple so that they can go home. Except they're separated from each other for a large chunk of this process and anytime they do interact, they're just complaining to each other about how frustrated they are that their plans aren't working. This is when you realize that Mac and Brady don't even have a problem in their relationship. Mac is the only one with a problem in this movie. Mac has this surprisingly decent character arc about realizing that being successful doesn't mean making a lot of money and earning a lot of rewards. Her mom wrote in her journal before she died that she wanted her daughter to become a great success and march through life triumphantly. And Mac interpreted this as being rich and successful, hence the deal with her aunt. By the end of the movie though, Mac really realizes that her mom meant that she wanted Mac to be a confident person who would pursue their dreams no matter what others say. And besides all of the explicit statements of this theme in the writing, I thought it was a pretty well done arc. But what does this have to do with Brady? Sure, Brady is affected by this because he wants to be with Mac, and if she leaves to go to the private school, their relationship might fall apart. But he barely engages with this conflict in the movie besides telling Mac to stop being such a killjoy and supporting her in her final decision. In reality, Layla is the one who facilitates Mac's arc. Mac spends the movie encouraging Layla to break free from the sexist stereotypes of the 1960s and surf, to do what she wants to do rather than what others expect her to do. It's through this that Mac realizes she needs to follow her own advice and tell her aunt that going to the private school isn't what she wants to do. She literally states this in the movie. Without Layla, her arc wouldn't be complete. And Brady just kind of smiles and nods, and soon their relationship is back to normal. Even if they're relationship is just a plot device to add drama, at least Mac has a pretty good arc on her own. Her other role as the movie's straight man has a messy execution though. The writing often comes off as annoying and a stick in the mud rather than witty commentary on the situations, and Maya Mitchell's one note acting exemplifies this problem. I appreciate Mac's arc, but she's just not a very likable character. With Brady, we have the exact opposite problem. Ross Lynch was literally just Austin Moon on Disney Channel, that's it. They would not give this man any other kind of character. Brady just acts like a less obnoxious version of Austin Moon. He's a sweet, dopey surfer boy who is just there to be Mac's nice boyfriend. Compared to Mac's constantly grumpy demeanor, Brady is a breath of fresh air and I found myself caring more about him even though he had zero development. This poor kid, the whole movie he's just waiting for Mac to figure out her problems so that they can be together again. Mac and Brady are a bit of a mess. Their relationship is very half-baked and thrown together, but both of them are okay as standalone characters, even if it is for different reasons. So let's talk about Layla and Tanner, who despite being a shallow pair up thrown together at the end, still have a better romance than Mac and Brady in my opinion. Layla and Tanner don't have a ton of development, they're mainly just caricatures made to poke fun at old movie tropes, so there's not too much to talk about here. For what they're worth, they are very fun characters to follow, and do a pretty good job at parodying their respective cliches. Tanner is dumb, self-absorbed, and shallow. 
but I still love him. He's mostly just used for gags, but it is clear that Tanner cares about others and wants to make Layla happy. Despite sticking to form pretty strictly in most areas, he goes against the norm and doesn't view bikers as harshly as his surfer friends. In the end, he becomes a supportive boyfriend for Layla, who helps her in their common goal to unite the surfers and bikers. And despite his lack of development, he proves to be a funny character who is easy for the audience to love. Layla is pretty similar in that regard. She does a great job of representing the doe-eyed damsel of old movies in a funny and likable way. But unlike Tanner, she gets her own mini character arc. Layla's arc revolves around her old-fashioned view of gender roles clashing with Mac's modern viewpoint. And Mac inspires her to break free from the stereotypes and do what she wants, which in this case is being a female surfer. Yeah, even though there are girl surfers, they aren't allowed to surf, and by that same extent, I'm pretty sure the female bikers aren't allowed to ride motorcycles. It seems pretty obvious how contradictory this is, but a lot of these people are very dumb, so I guess they don't notice this. When discussing feminist themes, Teen Beach Movie follows the girl power method that was standard for kids' media at the time. Girls are awesome and can do anything no matter what the mean old boys say. The way that it's shown is very unsubtle and cheesy, which is in line with the overall tone of Teen Beach Movie, but it's still a good message to convey, so is there anything really wrong with it? Not entirely in my opinion. The only problem I have with Teen Beach Movie's feminism is that it simplifies the subject so much that it starts to create its own problems. Any character who does traditionally feminine things is portrayed as dumb and ditzy, and they only become cool whenever they do something that is considered masculine. Layla wants to wear a blue dress because Brady loves the ocean and she wants to make him happy? What's wrong with her? Doesn't she realize she's letting Brady manipulate her every move like a puppet master? Layla wants to be a surfer like Tanner and the other guys? You go, girl, show those men what you can do. And everyone wonders where all the I'm not like other girls people come from. Having this kind of girl power in a movie can unintentionally create the negative effect of making feminine traits seem bad or uncool. And I think it kind of defeats the purpose of the movement. It's not about making one set of gender traits look cooler than the other, it's about allowing people to not be defined by their gender and simply act as individual human beings. Maybe I'm overreaching here. Little girls might not be thinking about the subject this hard and instead just be inspired by someone like Layla who can do something that only boys are supposed to do, which is the desired outcome. I just know that these ideas can be presented in a much better way that doesn't belittle feminine traits in order to empower women because I've seen it done before. Also, it's just tacky, unsubtle writing. Even with these flaws, I still like Layla's arc, and it has a nice progression from her first meeting Mac, to becoming close with her, to being inspired by her confidence to make decisions for herself. I also appreciate that Layla's interest in surfing actually brings her and Tanner closer. Tanner is skeptical at first, but he's happy that someone is as excited about surfing as he is, which makes sense as he's already known to defy stereotypes with his positive view of the bikers. It can be messy at times and overall isn't anything that profound, but it's a nice character journey for Layla to go on. Layla and Tanner are both fun characters who add a lot of life and humor to Teen Beach Movie with their likable personalities and cute romance with each other. Alright, who's up next on the character list? We got Sea Cat, Rascal, Giggles, Chi Chi, Struts, Lugnut, <laughs> and my personal favorite of the side characters, Butchie. They're mainly just here for gags and to do cool dances in the musical numbers. Speaking of, let's talk about the soundtrack. Honestly, this entire OST is iconic. All of the songs have this feel-good, high-energy vibe that works perfectly with the campy fun of Teen Beach Movie. Obviously, there's nothing groundbreaking, and most of the songs are pretty simplistic with their lyrics and instrumentals, but it does better than you'd expect for a Disney Channel movie. I like all of the songs on the soundtrack, but some of my favorites would have to be Cruisin' for a Bruisin', Fallin' for Ya, and Can't Stop singing. The songs blend together the retro 1960s sound with a modern style of music in a satisfying way that makes for a pretty great soundtrack. Along with that, the choreography for these numbers is surprisingly complex and really fun to watch in the movie. Similarly to High School Musical, the songs are what make Teen Beach Movie so well remembered by the kids who grew up on it, and they save the overall experience from being forgettable. Right, you're probably thinking, all this pretentious video essay analysis is good and all, but is the movie worth watching or not? Would I willingly sit down 
around and watch Teen Beach Movie. You know, if I wasn't making a video or if someone didn't ask me to watch it with them. Obviously, I would not. It's a Disney Channel movie. It's got the same hit or miss acting, dialogue, and editing as every other DCOM. I think the better question is, if I had to watch a Disney Channel movie with someone, would I watch this? Teen Beach Movie is definitely up there as one of the best DCOMs made. It's got a lot of charm, charisma, and potential for greatness if handled by the right people. Despite its flaws, I did enjoy my rewatch of this movie, and I think it worked so well because it was honest about what it was and didn't try to be anything more than that. Film can be a wonderful expression of a director's deepest thoughts and a magnificent display that widens the viewer's once narrow worldview or it can be entertainment. Teen Beach Movie is entertainment. It's like going to McDonald's in the middle of the night. You don't know why you have the sudden urge to do it, and it's probably not even worth the trip because the food isn't going to be that good, but you just want some reheated, overly salted, oily french fries. The kids of 2013 would have to agree with this sentiment, because I remember me and the rest of my friends loved this movie. The people spoke, and Disney Listened. Did the merchandise sales warrant a sequel? Of course. Did the story of the original movie warrant a sequel? Not at all. Admittedly, there was a sequel tease during the credits of the first movie. Layla, along with some surfers and bikers, came walking out of the ocean only to find that they've somehow been transported to the modern world as a man tries to help them use his cell phone to find their way home. But the wet side story characters traveling to the real world is an idea, it's not a story. Well, with enough cash, coffee, and crunch time, I'm sure those smart writers can come up with some kind of a plot. And you know what? From the looks of it, we're not off to a bad start. Teen Beach Movie 2 starts with the end of summer. Mac and Brady are glad that they've gotten to spend more time together rather than having Mac leave for private school, but Brady is feeling a bit apprehensive about the start of the school year. After all, they've only known each other during the summer. What if being in school pulls them apart and ruins their relationship? I mean, that must be a very fragile relationship for that to happen, but I'd better just keep my mouth shut for now before I go off on a giant tangent. Mac assures Brady their relationship will be just fine, and they start heading to shore, only for Mac to realize she lost the necklace Layla gave to her at the end of the first movie. She decides it's probably somewhere off in the middle of the ocean at this point and doesn't think it's worth searching for. The next day, Mac and Brady head back to high school, and they encounter some conflict when they discover that Mac is a straight A honor student while Brady wears flip-flops to school that heathen. This conflict carries on throughout the rest of the movie as Brady tries to follow Mac's overachiever lifestyle but fails to because of his laid-back nature. Meanwhile, in the movie world, Layla and Tanner are forced to act out the plot of Wet Side Story for Eternity, although they still remember their time with Mac and Brady, so it's not like their memory gets reset each time they do the movie. Sounds like pure torture to me. After having her eyes opened by Mac, Layla is questioning her meager role as the pretty love interest of Wet Side Story, and she wants to do something more with her life. When the magical necklace washes up on the shore of the movie world after Mac lost it in the ocean, it serves as the perfect way out for Layla, and she holds it while walking into the ocean in order to travel to the real world. Tanner, concerned for her well-being, follows after her, and the two end up in the modern world. Mac and Brady discover Layla and Tanner on the beach and are happy to see them, but they know they need to get them back to the movie world before people in the real world start to question where they're from. Unfortunately, Layla and Tanner are enamored with the technology and opportunities of the modern world and don't want to leave. Similarly to the first movie, Mac and Brady have to work together to get Layla and Tanner to want to go back home and in the process solve their own relationship problems. Over time, Layla only becomes more enthralled with the freedom women have in the modern world and wants to stay there to pursue her own destiny. Tanner just kind of takes some selfies and then is like, okay, let's go home now. Either way, the movie shifts focus to Layla's conflict between wanting to stay in the real world and being obligated to play her part in the movie world. Despite Mac and Brady's attempts to convince her, Layla refuses and even throws their only way home back into the ocean, the magical necklace. Meanwhile, the movie world is breaking apart without its two leads there, and things get serious when people start Thanos snapping out of existence. Luckily, the necklace washes up on the shore of the movie movie world, and the supporting cast uses it to travel to the modern world and get Layla and Tanner back. Layla still doesn't want to go home, but when Butchie explains that people are disappearing, she decides she'll have to sacrifice her personal desires to protect her friends. Mac and Brady are still having some issues in their relationship though, so Tanner rallies the movie characters to travel to the modern world one last time so that they can save Mac and Brady's relationship. They help Mac and Brady realize that they can still work as a couple even with their different lifestyles before returning home just in time to save the movie. Yes, we we will 
we'll talk about that ending. Just let me get some things out of the way first. I am once again asking, why are Mac and Brady a couple? <laughs> they can't encounter even the most minor of roadblocks in their relationship without breaking down. They freak out because they have friends who have opposing personalities, both of whom are unfortunately just kind of forgettable and annoying. No, I don't know their names, even though I've got the names of all the surfers and bikers memorized. And then Brady gets distracted and accidentally misses the college tour he and Mac were supposed to go to, and apparently neither of them even want to attempt making amends because they immediately break up. I understand that the movie needs conflict and relationship drama is the perfect way to do that, but could you tone it down just a little bit? Mac and Brady can still have important problems in their relationship that cause real conflict without each one resulting in them immediately wanting to separate. It's just getting ridiculous at this point and it makes it hard to get invested in their romance because about 10% of their scenes are them actually being in love and 90% are them bickering over some kind of petty drama. I was really hoping the sequel would improve on this problem, but it looks like we're back to square one with these two. Fortunately, the writers did improve on one of their weaknesses from the first installment. Brady finally gets development! Brady's arc is on the same level as Max from the first movie, if not even a bit better. I don't think it's explicitly stated, but I'm assuming Brady and Mac are in their junior year of high school since they're starting to get serious about finding a college. Mac, of course, is doing just fine with her all honors classes and 15 extracurricular activities, but Brady feels intimidated by the prospect of college. He's never been good at school, and so he feels like college will be just the same way. Surfing is the one thing he's passionate about, and he spends hours engineering complex surfboard designs like a foldable board and one with a motor in it, but he doesn't think he could ever make a career out of that. Over the course of the movie, Brady hides his passion from Mac because he's embarrassed and worries she'll just think it's a waste of time, causing friction between the two as Mac doesn't like Brady keeping secrets from her. By the end of the movie, Mac finds out about Brady's hobby, and to his surprise, she's really impressed by his talent and tells him that building surfboards like this takes a lot of ability that she doesn't even have. And in the end, Brady's motorized surfboard is what allows Layla and Tanner to get home just before they disappear. Brady's character arc itself isn't incredibly written or anything, but I really appreciate it because of its message. Too often we think that being smart means getting all A's and going into a smart people field like science or medicine. I think we underestimate how much intellect it takes to know how something works, be able to break it apart, and be able to build it back together again. Brady's struggle with the confining nature of school is something I'm sure a lot of kids can relate to, but we don't see a lot of movies or TV shows offering a solution to this. I appreciate that this movie shows Brady that he has just as much potential to be successful as the book Smart Mac. It's not that their talents aren't equal, they're just different, and I thought that was an interesting and really wholesome message for Brady's arc to convey. Like Brady in the first movie, Mac kind of stays on the sidelines development-wise and doesn't go through any major change besides repairing her relationship with Brady. Although, her character really confused me in this movie. In Teen Beach Movie, she comes to this big realization that going to the private school isn't for her, and that she wants to have control over her own life rather than becoming an academic success like her aunt wants her to. But then, immediately in Teen Beach Movie 2, Mac is cartoonishly obsessed with doing well in school and running around like a little politician with 10 different environmental campaigns going on at once. I don't know why she didn't go to the private school because it seems like she would have done just fine there. It's not that big of a deal, really none of this video is that big of a deal, but it's just kind of odd and doesn't seem fitting considering Mac's character in the first movie. But enough about Mac and Brady, how are Layla and Tanner doing? Layla and Tanner get a much bigger spotlight in this movie and pretty much share the runtime with Mac and Brady, and I enjoy getting to see them more because they were one of my favorite parts of the first movie. Speaking of favorites... I love Tanner. I always thought Tanner's actor handed up the most out of the cast of the first movie, but even that performance was tame compared to whatever he's doing in this movie. He really just wanted to see how ridiculous he could act and get away with it, and it's so fun to watch. It sometimes goes a little too far, and the writing feels a bit insulting to his character at times. Guys, he's literally a toddler in this movie, and it's a little too condescending. Here, check this out. Thanks. But I've never seen a Disney actor go as unhinged as Tanner does in this movie, and it's really funny to me for some reason. It gets even funnier whenever you find out that Tanner gets an emotional beat in this movie. Tanner has fun with all the exciting new things in the modern world, but deep down, all he really cares about is Layla. And in one scene where Tanner and Brady are alone, Tanner admits to Brady that he's worried that he isn't good enough for Layla anymore. It honestly caught me off guard and was a nice subversion of expectations, as we don't really see guy characters 
characters worry that they'll be good enough for their girlfriend, and it's usually the other way around. And for this scene, Tanner's actor goes so hard, like you can tell he really wants us to feel the pain that Tanner is going through right now. I enjoyed it, it was just so out of nowhere considering Tanner's behavior for the rest of the movie. I love Tanner, and I don't think the movie appreciates him enough. Case in point? Layla. Layla's arc in this movie is just kind of her doing her arc from the first movie over again. I guess because the movie resets each time, Layla has to go back to her role as the love interest and everyone is sexist to her again? But they clearly remember their time with Mac and Brady, so I'm confused as to why everyone is suddenly so unaccepting of her doing things that only guys are supposed to do when Mac already helped them break those stereotypes. Even if it's a little annoying, it doesn't matter that much as long as the character arc is good. Layla reaches a point where she can't contain her curiosity any longer, and travels to Mac's world in the hopes of finding some better opportunities for herself. When she gets there, her wish is granted. She loves going to school and learning new things, and can't wait to make a life for herself. Sounds like some pretty good character development to me, and it is. Despite the execution being as on the nose as the feminism in the last movie, it's a standard but well done character arc where Layla discovers who she truly wants to be. Unfortunately, things get complicated when you consider Layla's responsibility to the movie world. Without her and Tanner there, people are literally disappearing from existence. Sure, Layla can become a girl boss like she's always wanted, but she'll have to do so with blood on her hands. And this ruins the arc. It turns Layla's pursuit of a better life for herself from a noble aspiration to something done with selfish intentions that disregard the feelings and literal lives of others. But there might be a solution to this problem. What if Layla could fulfill her responsibility as a movie character and live a more free life? What if she could change the movie. What if she started a cult? So, Layla changes the story of the movie so much that it turns from wet side story to Layla, queen of the beach. I guess it's supposed to be feminist because a woman is in charge, but it reeks of girl boss feminism. Layla's basically performing the same kind of toxic masculinity and self-absorption that Tanner was in wet side story. Although I think she's taking it to a much farther extreme by making the entire movie literally revolve around her. They're all in a cult, I swear. But while I think it is kind of tacky and not a good representation of feminism, I'm mostly joking with my complaints here. The main thing about this change that made me and most other fans mad was how it affected the lives of Mac and Brady. And by affected, I mean completely transformed the timeline. Because Wet Side Story became Layla Queen of the Beach, instead of it being that Mac and Brady met when Brady was watching Wet Side Story on the beach, now Brady meets Mac when she's showing Layla Queen of the Beach at her Save the Ocean fundraiser. And their personalities are completely flipped, with Mac being being the fun-loving surfer inspired by Layla, and Brady being the practical, down-to-earth one who doesn't understand the hype around the movie. Teen Beach Movie 2 basically pulls the it was all a dream ending on us, and it's terrible. All of those journeys we went on with the characters, all of the epic highs and lows, all of the song and dance numbers, it was for nothing! I know you might think I'm taking this way too seriously right now, but you have to understand that these movies were everything to younger me. Everything I thought was true. Everything I'd ever believed. It was all a lie! How could you do this to me, Deep Beach Movie? How could you? Oh, did I like the songs? Yeah, they were fine. Teen Beach Movie is an experience. By that, I mean a weird one. I watched the first movie on a Sunday evening when starting work on this video, and once I finished, I considered just jumping right into the second installment. I'd definitely have time to do so, it was only about an hour and a half long, but was I really going to put myself through two Teen Beach movies in one sitting? Well, I did. And I didn't regret it. Maybe it's because I miss those days. Actually, I don't really. I think my obsession with this movie showed how embarrassingly low my standards were for entertainment back then. But yeah, it is nice to go back with a movie like this. A messy movie with clunky writing and acting, but an overall simplicity that puts a smile on your face. It's why people love High School Musical, The Cheetah Girls, Camp Rock, Radio Rebel, and Lemonade Mouth. And it's why people love Teen Beach Movie. Thanks for watching this review, and I'll see you all next time.